share my screen and we'll get started. Uh, so today uh, we are going to be finishing up the physical geography of North America. And so at the unit B, uh, and then uh, at the end of the class, I will discuss what's going to be happening over spring break in terms of assignments. Um, and we come back, the day we get back from the break in this class, um, which is section two, but then again, this is being recorded for section three. Uh, there will be a quiz on return on March 11th. Uh, and then also be aware that article reviews four and five are due uh, for section two on March 4th and March 11th for section three. Uh, your article reviews four and five will be due on March 5th and 12th. Um, on, so I pushed the quiz back. Uh, originally, the quiz was going to be on the 13th of March for sections, for section, uh, for this section, section two. Um, and it was going to be on the 19th section, excuse me, it was going to be on the 14th of section three. So I pushed those back to the following week. Uh, so that quiz on unit A and B will be a comprehensive quiz. It will also be in Kahoot format. Um, and then there will be an article review due that week also, and it will be article review six. Uh, so we're going to. Again, pick it up from where we left off last time. And just to review, uh, we start off by looking at the Kirby Climate Region Map for North America. Uh, and we focused upon the uh, southeastern region of the United States. Uh, United States, contemporary United States, um, because that's where we are in Nashville, Tennessee, and also that is where most of uh, you all hail from in terms of your homes. Of course, there are a few people who are from the uh, DFA climate region, humid continental hot summer year round precipitation. Uh, and so as we move through this portion of the court, we may uh, know the fact that places such as Nashville, Tennessee, and other cities that are in the uh, CFA climate region have a couple of unique characteristics in terms of climate. Uh, so again, uh, climate is a description of atmospheric conditions in uh, relatively long periods of time. And so, for instance, when we were looking at the climate graph for Nashville from the climate.chart map, uh, we noticed that that data was drawn from 1990 to 2019, approximately a 30-year period. So climate is a description of atmospheric conditions such as temperature, uh, flow of the sunlight, uh, cloud cover, uh, precipitation, barometric pressure, wind direction, uh, over a long period of time. Whereas weather is limited to short periods, usually down to a day. So weather is a description of atmospheric conditions today. Uh, how much precipitation are we going to get 
today, that's weather. Uh, how much, what percentage of clouds are covering the sky today? Uh, that's weather. Um, what's the temperature going to be today? That's weather. Uh, and in some cases, we might extend out to a five-day forecast for weather. Uh, when we look at climate, uh, the two main components of climate are, of course, temperature and precipitation, as you can see on this climate graph. And one of the uh, unique characteristics of a climate graph for this region of the country is we get precipitation pretty much every month. And in the case of Nashville, that's about four inches of precipitation every month. Uh, we're going to see that there are going to be places that do not share uh, that characteristic uh, after a while. Uh, we also, just to review, looked at thunderstorm days per year, and we may know the fact that Florida has the highest concentration of thunderstorms as we move toward the west. California, Washington State, Oregon, uh, very few thunderstorms. Uh, so thunderstorms are not equally distributed uh, across uh, North America, in this case, the contemporaneous United States. Uh, the companion to thunderstorms, of course, is lightning. And here we have a small scale choropleth map. Uh, choropleth map uses color area symbols to uh, provide information to the map reader. Again, lightning being concentrated in Florida. We talked about how great a hazard lightning is. We also uh, talk, discussed how to uh, calculate how far we are away from a bolt of lightning based upon the speed of sound. Uh, so that might be something that will come up later. Yes. Um, then finally, not finally, um, I think we pretty much left off looking at tornadoes and, of course, tornado frequency. And we saw, made note of the fact that this Great Plains region is home to the greatest, highest frequency of tornadoes. And so as we are looking at this southeastern or southern region, yes, Florida does have propensity of tornadoes. But in general, where we are, we would assume that we're safe because we are in an area that doesn't get a lot of tornadoes relative to the Great Plains region, otherwise known as Tornado Alley. But of course, we learned soon afterwards that we are in what is known as the Tornado, Killer Tornado Alley. So even though we are not in a part of the country that experiences the most Frequent tornadoes, which is Tornado Alley, which encompasses North Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, um, Oklahoma, and so on and so forth. Um, we are in a region that uh, has the greatest risk for a human being being killed by a tornado. And we talked about the four reasons for why uh, that is here in this part of the country. Um, and then as an example of, as a personal example of tornado hazard, uh, I shared with you my ex personal experience with tornado uh, in 1995. So the title of this article is Expert Sees Tornado Clouds Up Close says David Padgett, that's me, uh, steered his small car, it was a Chevy Nova, uh, on my way to work. And so uh, what happened was I was on my way to work. I was working at Austin Peay State University at that time, not here. And uh, here we go. Pull this map up. 
showed me exactly where I was. So I was in what we call, I guess, East Nashville, it's where I used to live, on Dickerson Road here. And that morning I drove Dickerson Pike, got on the viewing, hit Brick Church Pike, and my plan was to get on Raleigh Parkway and then hit Interstate 24 and drive out to Austin Peay State University where I happen to work. Um, I think I was right about here, right there, uh, when things changed suddenly um, for me, as described in the article. So what happened was I was driving to work, got on to Brick Church Pike, and all of a sudden, as it says in this article, uh, the wind started blowing. Like I couldn't believe how hard the wind was blowing. And then all of a sudden, everything just went black. And I could not see anything. Uh, I could feel my car start to lift up off the ground. Now, had I been thinking rationally, uh, I would have done the right thing. So it says here in the article, here's some tornado uh, safety tips. Uh, one of the tornado safety tips is leave your vehicle and seek immediate shelter. Well, why should you uh, leave your vehicle um, during a tornado? Uh, well, here's why. So this is what happened to a car. These are three storm chasers a few years ago who were killed um, because they didn't leave their car. And that's what happened to the car. That's what a tornado can do to your car. Um, so the best thing to do is to get out of your car because a tornado can toss your car around like a little toy. And these three men lost their lives. And they were... Storm chasers, they, you think that they would know better, um, but of course they lost their lives. So I didn't quite, I didn't, obviously I didn't have a chance to leave my car because I couldn't see anything. The wind was howling. I can't even describe you what it felt like. Uh, so I gunned the vehicle. I just I hit the gas as hard as I could and I sped around to so I was right here, I got on Brick Church, I got in that dark cloud, and I drove under this underpass here. Uh, and so that could have been a really horrible mistake. Um, why shouldn't I have driven under that underpass? Anybody? Why should I have not driven under that underpass? Yes, it could have collapsed. That underpass or overpass, it could have collapsed on top of me. And that's how powerful tornadoes are. But, you know, it's one thing to say what we will do in a certain situation uh, until we actually get into the situation. And then we panic, and that's basically what I did. I panicked. I did not leave my car. I don't know. I, I might not have been a good idea. I don't know. It was a tough situation to be in. Um, amazingly, and it says here, uh, about 10 minutes later, the sun was out. So tornadoes are very um, concentrated, low pressure areas. Uh, so tornadoes are very concentrated, low pressure areas. So if a tornado would show up very well on an ISO bar. So remember, I ISO bars are ISO lines that connect points of equal barometric pressure. Uh, and so uh, tornadoes are so concentrated that in some cases, a tornado can completely obliterate a, a building house and a house or building right next to it is almost untouched. Uh, so that is, now this particular tornado uh, kept going after it went over top of my car and hit Rivergate Mall and caused a lot of damage at Rivergate Mall in Hollywood Williamsville. And so 
I didn't know that the tornado had hit Rivergate Mall until after I got to work. And the newspaper called me, of course, because I'm an expert. They said, Dr. Padgett, uh, so you heard about the tornado. The tornado hit Rivergate Mall. And I said, it did. And they said, we'd like to interview you because you are an expert in atmospheric science. And could you share with us some information about the tornado? I said, oh, yeah, I can share with you some information. I was in it. <laughs> I was in it this morning. That's what that was. You know, so yeah, it was really, really a scary situation um, back in 1995. Uh, and so I never saw that tornado coming. And so it's like um, we explain one of the reasons why tornadoes are starting so deadly in this area of the country is because of there is a lot of uh, uneven topography, or in simple terms, we have lots of hills around here. The tornado can come right from behind the hill as opposed to um, in the Great Plains area of the country, which is relatively flat. Another reason why we have so many deadly tornadoes here in um, this part of the country with you know Alabama is leading in death is because we have the greatest percentage of nocturnal tornadoes. We have the greatest percentage of nocturnal tornadoes or tornadoes that happen at night. And so the tornado that came through TSU in 2003 uh, came through here at night. I don't know, I think I pulled that up. All right, oh, here it is. Uh, so, well, obviously none of you all were here in 2007. I think so. Uh, yeah, so a tornado came straight through campus. Uh, fortunately, it was spring break. It was March. I guess they call it March 2nd and 3rd because the tornado came through at about 12.03 a.m. It was in the middle of the night. Um, and so... Uh, the tornado did $20 million of damage to campus. This is, this, most of the damage occurred over on farm. Took Four buildings were completely destroyed. Like I said, luckily it was during spring break, so not a whole lot of students were around. Uh, thank goodness. Thank God. Thank whoever you want to thank. Uh, look at the destruction. So these are concrete um, containers or concrete facilities, and it just broke them apart. And this, I know if you notice on campus, there's like this big wrought iron fence that goes all the way around campus. That was just gone. I mean, it was gone. I mean, there was no, none of it. I don't know where it went, you know. Uh, so, and so TSU students uh, jumped into action, cleaned up the campus because nobody was coming over here to help us. Uh, and like I said, luckily um, on our campus, uh, there's one of the buildings that was destroyed. Um, and so luckily on our campus, nobody was uh, injured or uh, you know, some cars got damaged that were left behind by the students. Um, Cam, yeah, yeah, ask your question. So TSU students, who left their cars at the campus apartments because the tornado went right past the campus apartments. Um, were the windows in their car blown outward or inward? Inward. No, they were blown outward. Because remember what I said, a tornado is a very concentrated low pressure cell. And so what happened was when the tornado went past the campus apartments, the pressure, air pressure inside the cars was greater than the pressure outside the cars. The windows blew out. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon, uh, tornado. So yeah, I've, I've been in a couple of tornadoes. That was the first one. The second one was a 1998 tornado that went through downtown Nashville. And guess where I was? I was in downtown Nashville uh, when that tornado went through there. Uh, man, I didn't really see that one as close up as the one that went over my car. Or not over my car, I was in it. Um, um, but still, you know, just as, as scary a situation. 
Okay, so let's look at some other um, regions of the country and different uh, climate regions. And so this is your geography of North America. So let's go to Ottawa, Canada. Notice that Ottawa, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. So just like Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, Ottawa is the capital city of Canada. Uh, if you notice, if you take a look at this climograph, uh, notice that, again, D climates are similar to C climates, uh, well, C, F climates, um, in terms of precipitation distribution. So notice that here in Ottawa, same, uh, Precipitation, monthly precipitation pattern approximately as, um, as Nashville. So it's just to give you a perspective of where Ottawa is. There it is, just north of the border of New York and Canada. So, of course, if we go to our Kirpin climate map, clearly see that zoom in is Pennsylvania, New York, Ontario, Toronto, EFB, DFB, we have a little DFA there, probably modified by the lakes. Um, so there's Ottawa, EFB climate on our climate map. So another thing that you should be able to interpret from these climate graphs, and some of you all, those of you who did GIS assignment three, uh, you had the opportunity to compare and contrast climate graphs, and you really didn't have a whole lot to go on. But one of the things that you should notice in terms of differentiating amongst different climate regions is that D climates have perhaps the greatest temperature range. And so the temperature range is the difference between the highest average temperature and the lowest average temperature experience in a place during the year. So if we look at Ottawa, Canada, let's see, Heatley. Yeah. Okay, what is the in degrees Fahrenheit? Let's just make it easy on you. What month of the year in Ottawa, Canada has the lowest temperature, average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? What month do you think that is based upon this graph? January. And approximately how many degrees Fahrenheit is that? Like maybe 13. Uh, 13. Let's say. Well, you, you say 13. Okay, let's go it with 13. Uh, what about the high? What month, what month is the highest temperature? Right. Uh, July. Okay, July. Approximately how many degrees Fahrenheit is July's like average? 68. 68 degrees Fahrenheit, right on 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So 68 minus 13 is what? 55. 55, exactly. So there's a 55 degree temperature range for Ottawa, Canada. That's quite wide. You know, that's very, so it gets relatively warm in the summer in Ottawa, and it gets relatively chilly in, in the winter. Uh, 14 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is below freezing. Uh, and so, well, actually it's not. Uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the melting point of ice. 
It's not the freezing point of water. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so very wide temperature range there for, or relatively, I should say relatively wide, wide temperature range, 55 degrees Fahrenheit in this case. Um, and we'll, when we get later on into this lecture, we will see that there are going to be some differences in terms of that. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's look at a different region of the country. So we've gone, we looked at sea climates, we looked at D climates. Um, and I would be remiss if we did not discuss uh, D climates. One of the big differences between D climates and perhaps C climates and A climates are the different forms of precipitation. Well, let's say forms of precipitation. And so obviously one of liquid precipitation is known as rain. How does rain form? Uh, rain. Rain forms of, uh, well, rain forms be a, the process of condensation. Uh, condensation occurs on a surface. So if you showered this morning, you probably noticed on the mirror or wherever it was water collecting on the mirror, perhaps. Uh, that's when water changes from being a gas to a liquid. That's called condensation. Uh, and so, well, condensation has to take place on a surface. Uh, so, Morris, what's the surface in the atmosphere? There's no mirrors in the atmosphere. So, what does condensation take place upon in the atmosphere? What does condensation take place upon the atmosphere when when water turns from a gas form to liquid form? It has to take place on the surface. In your bathroom, you take a shower, that surface is the mirror. What surface is in the atmosphere that allows raindrops to You'll never guess. It's dust particles. So you have dust, if we didn't have, if there weren't dust particles in the atmosphere, there would be no rain, right? So the condensation takes place upon dust particles. Technical term for those dust particles is what we call condensation nuclei. Uh, so there are several types of solid precipitation. There is uh, sleet. And so sleet is when uh, precipitation falls to earth in solid form in that process is freezing or it's, you know that. Um, sleet, you can see sleet, you know, little balls of ice, they bounce off your windowsill, they bounce off your car, you hear sleet sometimes. Uh, there's another form of frozen precipitation that's in solid, uh, but it's kind of solid, but it becomes solid, but it's freezing rain. Uh, they also, of course, the, uh, but falls to earth, falls to earth in liquid form, freezes on contact solid objects, such as your car, uh, a tree. Uh, you've all seen freezing rain. Now, what's dangerous about freezing rain is it forms something called black ice on the roads. Um, black ice looks and appears as if it's just a wet road. And, and this is where, as I mentioned before, water 
can be in liquid form and colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit because 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the melting point of ice. It is not the freezing point of water. That's a misconception a lot of people have. Probably just about everybody in the world, pretty much, except Earth scientists. <laughs> so yes, water can fall to Earth at temperatures colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but then when it hits your car, lands on a tree, lands on the street, it solidifies. And of course, we've all had all kinds of fun scraping that uh, ice off of our cars after freezing rain, or worse yet, encountering black ice in our cars. Uh, and that's a tough situation uh, to be in. Then there's hail. So hail it can occur anywhere. So these various forms of precipitation that are solid are most closely associated with um, these D and E climate regions, the colder climate regions, of course, people in those parts of the country are used to, uh, um, well, I'll get to snow, maybe I should do snow. So people in the deep climate regions are used to sleet, freezing rain, snow, um, especially snow. Um, and so, of course, in solid form and via something called deposition. So what is deposition? Uh, deposition is when water vapor turns from a gas to a solid without ever becoming a liquid. It goes straight from a gas to a solid. Um, Jones, during the deposition process, this is when, this is how snow forms through deposition. Um, water vapor goes from being gas to a solid without ever becoming a liquid. During that process, crystallization occurs. What do we call those crystals? Wait, you said, you said it stays into a solid? The way that snow forms is when water vapor, the water vapor is invisible, can't see it. So clouds are not water vapor. The the condens the liquid that cond cond condensates on your mirror that that's that's water. It's not water vapor. So water vapor is invisible to the human eye. When water vapor uh, turns from a gas to a solid without ever becoming a liquid, that's called the deposition process. Uh, that's how snow forms. During that process, crystals form. What do we call those crystals? So what process am I describing? What am I talking about? How forming here? Um, so precip precipitation, deposition. What kind of what kind of precipitation am I talking about? Snow, right? Mm -hmm. So during the process by which snow forms, crystals are created. What do we call those crystals? When snow forms. Yeah, those snowflakes. That's, a, that's why you have snowflakes, because in deposition, crystallization takes place, and you have very pretty snowflakes that occur. OK, now the last. Um, Now, now, of course, hail falls to earth in solid form, but hail is most closely associated with um, Cumulonimbus 
clouds, oops, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. So oftentimes a thunderstorm. So oftentimes a, a sure sign that a tornado is coming is hail. So what happens? So what happens is, remember, a tornado is a very uh, focused area of low pressure. So low pressure means that air is rising and rising and rising, and then it starts to spin because of the rotational uh, rotation of the earth, and that's called the Coriolis force, and that's how we get a tornado. If you have a really much a much larger storm like that, it's called, of course, a hurricane. Hurricanes are very large, huge, low pressure uh, system. Uh, so what happens is these convectional processes or rising air uh, push frozen balls of ice back up into the atmosphere. So what happens is rain, rain forms, it starts to fall to earth, it gets caught up in the updraft, it gets pushed up to the upper parts of the atmosphere, freezes into little ice balls, tries to come down to earth, is pushed up again, freezes some more, they get bigger, and the more times that those balls of ice get pushed back up higher into the cold part of the atmosphere, the bigger they become. And in some cases, you get golf ball size hail, baseball size hail, and whatnot. Um, and so those are the various forms of precipitation. So I mentioned them at this part, part of course, because um, because People who are who reside in the decline regions are much more familiar with snow. Uh, and part of the reason that we had such a hard time at the beginning of the semester is because we are in a region of the country that is not accustomed to snow, as you probably found out at the beginning of the semester. Um, here, there is no real snow removal at all. Uh, we are off the lane on the interstate, maybe large streets like uh, Gallatin Pike and maybe um, Rosa Parks Boulevard might get a little treatment. But those are those kind of four, six lane wide roads. After that, you were on your own. I could not get out of my neighborhood uh, for a week. Uh, and that's why before it snows or when there's a prediction of snow, people raid the grocery stores because they know. Uh, and, and this was a very unusual case. Normally, we might be frozen in for a day or two. This year, we got eight inches of snow, which is highly unusual for this part of the country. And then it it stayed below 30 degrees Fahrenheit for a week. And of course, that snow and ice went absolutely nowhere. It was right there a week later. And where I live, I live up on the top of a big hill. And then I lived to, to go up a hill about a half mile and then down another hill to get into my neighborhood. And nobody could get out of there. Trapped <laughs> for a week. Luckily, I had enough food. Uh, to last a week, I was fine. No problem. Um, now, I spent a year living in Cleveland, Ohio. It was the exact opposite situation in Cleveland, which is DFA climate. Uh, when I was in Cleveland that winter, it snowed every day. I'm not exaggerating. It snowed. We got snow absolutely every day. Not accumulations. Sometimes it would snow like an inch, maybe an inch or two. If there was an inch or two of snow that fell in Cleveland when I was there, it wasn't even on the news. Nobody said anything. That was just life. You know? um, now, if we get an inch or two of snow here, it's, oh, we're batting down the hatches. Oh, it's snowing. Oh, shut down the schools. You know, Don't go out. You know, People aren't used to snow here. 
Go to Walmart, Kmart, they still have Kmart. Go to any store here and try to look for a sled. You're not going to find one. Try to find a snow shovel here. You're not going to find one. You know, it's not that kind of place. Uh, so there is a significant difference in terms of frozen precipitation. You get into those regions. So I'm going to shift a little bit. We've already talked a little bit about the, the Great Plains region, uh, but let's get into some B climates. So we've talked about C climates, D climates. Now, this region of the country is where we have the um, BSK. So a BSK climate is a semi-arid or sometimes known as what's known as a steppe climate um, region. Uh, and then, of course, when we get into, into and around um, Las Vegas and Phoenix, Las Vegas, Nevada, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, those climates are desert climates. Notice BWH is hot desert. So a lot of us mistakenly believe that all deserts are hot. No, there are cold deserts. Uh, let's see if I'm able to find an example. There it is, cold desert climate. We start to get up into Northern Nevada. So a desert is not defined based upon temperature. A desert is a region or place that receives less than 10 inches of precipitation per year. Uh, so a desert is a region or place that receives less than 10 inches of, of precipitation per year. Uh, so for example, let's look at the Las Vegas climate graph here. So again, well, there are a few ways that we can determine the um, precipit average precipitation using this climate graph, either through observation or basically reading, right? We're just reading the graph. It's the roll stuff. Have you signed the roll yet? You signed the roll. Thank you. Okay, so um, Campbell. Um, can you see this graph? Can you see all of it? Okay, based upon any part of this graph, tell me approximately how many inches of precipitation fall in Las Vegas every year, approximately, using the whole graph. Anything on the graph. Remember, your answer must be in inches, not millimeters. Um, I'm going to just say 60. How many? Okay, that was a hard question. Yeah, I don't know. What's the first piece of information that you need that we talked about on Monday? I know I talked about this on Monday. About those millimeters and in inches, what's the conversion factor? It's an easy conversion, which will get you right to the answer. Okay, approximately how many millimeters are there in one inch? Remember that? Remember that Monday? Nobody remembers that. Okay, what if I told you, Campbell, that there are 25 millimeters per inch? Now, how many inches of precipitation fall in Las Vegas every year on average? Given that you can use any part of this graph, anything, anything that's written on the graph, you can look at the graph. The answer is like right there. If it was a snake, it would bite you. Um, six. Why do you say six? I have no clue. Okay. Re Read some of the things on the graph. Is there any, are there any words on the graph? Read some of the uh, information that's on the graph out loud to yourself. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Well, 
Well, there's four pieces of information across the top of the graph. So which one of them do you think is the annual precipitation amount? The last one. Which is 101 millimeters, right? Okay, now you've got the answer. How many millimeters are there per inch? That's okay, so now how many inches of precipitation fall on average in Las Vegas? You have everything you need to answer this question. Four. four, yes, exactly. Four inches, yes. Four inches. So Las Vegas obviously is defined as a desert. That's less than 10 inches of precipitation per year. That's very dry. Think about it. Four inches per year? It almost never rains in Las Vegas. Uh, and when it does, people panic as if it's snowing. Oh my gosh. When, when, when there's rain in Las Vegas, it's, it's horrible. I think they were supposed to have a music festival in Las Vegas earlier, the last year. I can't remember. It's a big something festival. It just got wiped out. It got wiped out. I can't remember. Um, uh, what was that? Vegas Music Festival Blood. The Burning Man, yeah, burning the Burning Man, Burning Man flooding, drowning thousands, heavy rain. This is what happened. I mean, and I don't think it was a whole lot of rain. <laughs> it might have been maybe three or four inches. I'm not going to hit any of these videos. Maybe I can find out this. what happened. It was what happened. To burning Man. People got stuck in the mud. Why did Why did Burning Man? They heavy rain. The cars couldn't get out. Okay. So this again. This is why when you when you did, um, or if you do, did GIS assignment three, and I compelled you in a scientific analysis, you do not use qualitative. See, here's what I mean by qualitative. It says heavy rains. What do we want to know? How much did it rain? Heavy rain. No, 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 no. How many inches? You know, this is why in science we don't use qualitative terms such as heavy. You know, if this, this was a scientific report, it would tell you exactly how many inches of rain fell. Oh, how much rain did Burning Man? Okay, it's five inches. No, wait, it said that, that flooding was caused by less than an inch of rain. Less than an inch of rain wiped out that music festival, right? So, Las Vegas, that region is a place that's very, very much unaccustomed uh, to receiving any amounts of precipitation. Uh, so even if it rains, it probably rained that much last night, then we're okay. Uh, another thing is that we have vegetation. Vegetation absorbs a massive amount of water, an unbelievable amount of water. Um, so, for example, Tennessee State University's campus is uh, 400 acres, right? If we got a half inch of rain on this campus, that would produce 40 million gallons of water. Half inch of precipitation over 400 acres produces 40 million gallons of water. But these trees, grass, absorb all of that. It's amazing, isn't it? Now in, in, in Nevada, Las Vegas, they don't have that kind of vegetation present. So that water has no place to go and it winds up instantly flooding the area. Um, now another, another uh, misconception about places like Las Vegas and Phoenix, Arizona, is that they are hot all year. Uh, if you notice from this climate graph, notice that in January, the temperatures are in the 40s, February. Uh, I was in Las Vegas last February. Why was I there? Oh, uh, I got caught up in the Southwest Airlines drama. 
And so, uh, well, not really, I just got delayed. People got stranded. I think it was December of 2022. People got stranded. People, it was bad. Oh, I just got this. delayed by Southwest. So as a result, Southwest, just like how AT&T is giving us whatever they're giving us, <laughs> I don't know yet. You know, these corporations give you uh, rebates and gifts when they mess up, right? So Southwest Airlines system crashed in December, 2022. And so in early 2023, they sent me a companion pass to go anywhere Southwest flies. Um, and so, you know, I can fly and I could somebody else would fly with me for free. And so, um, but I had to use a companion pass by March 3rd. Only had like two months. I got the companion pass in January. Uh, only had four free days. I'm a very busy person. I'm flying out of here today to go to FAMU because they need me down there for some reason. Anyway, um, cost to be the boss. Uh, so um, I got the companion pass. I only had four free days. And so I wish I could have gone to like Hawaii or something or I didn't have enough time to do that. Uh, so I decided to go to Las Vegas to see Ursha, among other things. So me and somebody's daughter went to Las Vegas. Me and somebody's daughter. Somebody's went to Las Vegas to see Ursha. Ursha. Great show. One of the few times I would say I got my money's worth. He put on a show. I don't, I'm not even a big Usher fan. I mean, I'm not, you know, Usher's good. He's all right. But um, great show. I, I got a hand. Great halftime show to Super Bowls. You know, I, I got to give the guys his, his props. Anyway, so it was February. And, man, it was cold. Oh, my goodness, it was cold out there. It, it, at night, it got down into the 20s. And during the day, it might have been in the maybe 40s. Sun was out. No, no rain. Ooh, it was cold out there. Um, but only had three months to use a companion pass. We'd much rather go to Vegas in the summertime when it is very, very hot. But then you just spend the whole day in the pool. See, day in the pool, go out at night in Vegas. So a lot of people assume that you know, when you usually see Vegas, it's hot, pool parties, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, but no, Vegas, because the um, air is dry, uh, there isn't the moisture that holds heat. Like here, we have relatively high humidity. We don't have as, we don't, it gets relatively, um, doesn't get as, it gets cold, but not, you know, we don't have, like, not, not, not like you would expect, like, oh, it's super hot in summer, Chilly in the in the winter. And people don't don't a lot of people go to Las Vegas for New Year's and they get surprised. Like, wow, it's cold here. Yes. I went to Las Vegas for New Year's. I knew it was gonna be cold, but I'm never I never did that again. Vegas, summer, pool parties, walking strip, whatever. Um now, not only does Vegas and other desert regions have a wide temperature range on an annual basis. Uh, because there is lack of moisture in the air, there's a wide range during the day. Uh, so let's say uh, during the day in Vegas, it might be 100, let's say 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, temperatures might drop down into the 40s that night. And so what happens is people, a lot of people uh, get into trouble Let's say they go to Las Vegas. There's, there are other things to do in Las Vegas besides uh, engage in foolishness. Uh, you can go to Red Rock Canyon. You can go hiking Red Rock Canyon. I, I just went there. I went there, yeah, when I was there in February. Oh, my goodness. That was really cold in Red Rock Canyon. Um, but, you know, we wanted to see some nature. We didn't want to spend all the time in Vegas. Uh, but in the summertime, people like to go hiking. So let's say... Uh, people might start off hiking and they don't listen. They just say, oh, I have my phone. I don't need to take a picture map. I don't use navigation. Are there any cell phone towers in the desert, people? No. Get out there. Get lost. This thing is doesn't, it's any good. It's a paperweight. This turns into a paperweight. Can't even call anybody. Now you're lost. And it's easy to get lost in the desert. I used to work in the desert for a couple of years, like way out in the same deserts. 
It's easy to get lost. Now you're lost. Now when you start off hiking, having your little t-shirt, shorts, maybe tennis shoes, and you're out there hiking, it was nine degrees Fahrenheit during the day. Now it's nine o'clock at night. Maybe 10 o'clock at night, you're still lost. You can't see, and it's 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Mars. Is it possible for a person to die if they're walking around in a t-shirt and shorts and 45 degrees Fahrenheit? Now, that's not freezing, but can a person die like that? In a t-shirt and shorts? Mm -hmm. 45 degrees Fahrenheit. No. Oh, yes, you can. It's called dying of exposure. What is the average human being's core body temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? What should it be? We should know this after the movie. We can see like it every, every day during COVID. Every day somebody was pulling the mom and ass. Isn't it like 98? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to say 78. That's what you saw. Yeah, 78 degrees. That's, that's, that's called a That's an inverse. Uh, so if you are walking around in a t-shirt and shorts and it's 45 degrees Fahrenheit and your core body temperature falls significantly, not doesn't have to fall that far below 98.6 degrees, you're in a lot of trouble. Think about the opposite direction. If you, if so, if you, if our core body temperature on average should be about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and it only goes up a little bit to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, are you okay? No, <laughs> no. So if it drops a couple degrees below 98.6, it, it doesn't take much. If you're in a t-shirt and shorts and you're walking around at 45 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, your core is not, and there's no place to hide out here. There's no shelter, nothing. No place to hide. You're just out there in the cold. So a lot of people get into trouble like that. So A, always learn how to read a paper map if you're going to go hiking, if you're, if you're going to get off the trail, right? Um, now, Red Rock Canyon, I mean, this is, it's beautiful, but it's safe. You know, people around, you know, it's not, it's not, not unless you get adventurous, you need to just have control out there. Um, now, another way that people get themselves into trouble in desert climates is due to the, so let's say, let's say you go to Vegas, maybe, yeah, let's see, maybe, uh, this is different schools. A lot of people, when they turn 30, go to Vegas. I don't know why that is, um, but it's fine. Vegas. Maybe by the time you're 30, you can afford to go to Vegas, right? You can afford it. In your 20s, you can go to Vegas in your 20s, but you're just going to be walking on the strip looking at stuff. Um, yeah, you go to Vegas, and let's say, you know, it's um, a big event, and you want to go to Dre's, and you <laughs> wait, you get to Dre's, and you're in line, and they ask you, would you like a section? And you think you're a baller, you say, yeah, sure, I want a section, how much? And they say, it's a thousand, starts at a thousand dollars. You're like, huh, what? <laughs> the key to Vegas, whenever you afford to get it, is don't go to the touristy places. There are places right off the strip that are black owned, $10 to get in, None of this section foolishness, good food, good music. You're not in there crowded like, like this. Right off the strip, like two or three blocks away. Um, you kind of go broke to go to Vegas. Um, but what happens to a lot of people is they get to Vegas and it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit and they're walking around and they're not perspiring at all. We don't like to perspire, do we? When we sweat, we feel bad. But perspiration is our body's warning system that tells us, hey, you are losing moisture. But if you're not sweating, you feel good. Hey, maybe those Zoom classes are working. Hey, I'm not sweating. And then somebody asks you, hey, you want to taste, want some water? No, I'm good. You sure you don't want any water? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not going to drink any water. I'm going to walk around 110 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. And I'm not going to drink any water at all. But Morris, if a person is walking around in 110 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, is their body losing moisture? 
Losing? Yes. Yeah. Of course it is. But they don't, but you don't feel it. You you feel great. You don't feel like you when you go to New Orleans or Houston, you feel like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm just sweat. Uh uh. But you're in Las Vegas, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're walking around, you feel great. But what's happening to all that? That um what's happening to the water that's leaving your body? How come you don't feel it? What is what's happening to it? What's, what process is that water going through? It starts with an E. Evaporation. Evaporation. Water cleaves your body, evaporates, you feel great. And the next time you see that person, they're laying out on the sidewalk. That's all you see in Vegas. People lay out on the sidewalk. And get them some water because they don't drink water. But when you're in Vegas or any or any desert climate, you should drink water, even if you don't feel thirsty because you're constantly becoming dehydrated. Um, and constantly, I was in, um, this is when I was much younger. I was in Phoenix, I was working in Phoenix, Arizona. And, you know, I think I'm a pretty tough guy. You know? So I was in Phoenix, it was 114 degrees Fahrenheit. I was, I was in my 20s. You think I drank any water? No, because I'm Mr. Macho. And drink any water. I walked around out there. I, I wasn't sweating. I got back to my hotel room. I could not drink. And I was so dehydrated. I, I don't know how many bottles of water I drank. It was so, you know, we have to be careful in these desert uh, climates. Uh, well, let's push to the west and we're going to find another type of sea climate. And this is the CS. Climate. So this is another sea climate region, but it's different. This is a West Coast type climate. Notice it says uh, warm summer Mediterranean climate, warm summer. So let's look at a typical um, climate graph for a um, for the West Coast region, and let's look at let's say San Francisco. Now we're going to notice two very interesting characteristics. Uh, about San Francisco, California's climate graph. Uh, one, notice the temperature range. Uh, Jones, what is, if you just look at that red, red uh, line, what is the lowest temperature on that red line for San Francisco, California, degrees Fahrenheit approximately? Approximately, what's the lowest temperature you see? Just, just on the red line, just follow the red line. And then you can read off of the uh, uh, axis on the, the left-hand side. So what is the lowest temperature during the year for San Francisco? The lowest high temperature? Is it like 50 something? About 59 degrees Fahrenheit. What about the high? What about the high? Highest. Um, like 70 or something? Yeah, maybe 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So 72 minus 59 is equals what? Thirteen. 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Now remember, we looked at Ottawa, Canada, what? That was 55 degrees Fahrenheit difference. Uh, even Nashville was about 50 degrees Fahrenheit difference between the high and the low. In San Francisco, it's only about 13 degrees difference. So notice that, look at July. This is the high temperature on average in San Francisco is maybe 70 degrees. Look at the low. The low is somewhere in the 50s in July. And that's normal. So a lot of people who've never been to California, think all of California is Southern California, right? LA, sunshine. And they go to San, I know people that do this. They go to San Francisco for work. They got a little, they pack a little, little clothes and they get to San Francisco and they're like, oh my goodness, you know? They end up having to buy a jacket and some case they think they're going to LA. No, this is totally different. Um, a totally different experience here. Uh, part of the reason why San Francisco's temperature is what it is, 
is where San Francisco is and the, the geography of San Francisco. San Francisco is again on a peninsula. So San Francisco is surrounded on three sides by water and so notice San Francisco is on the peninsula and also the uh, California current the California ocean current is a cold ocean current, uh, which modifies San Francisco's temperatures. Uh, and so that's why San Francisco's climograph, uh, in terms of temperature, has a very narrow temperature range. In fact, if you look at Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles or any place on the West Coast, there's not going to be a whole lot of difference in temperature during the year, not like here, right? Not like here. The only difference is in San Francisco, it's pretty much chilly the entire year. Uh, in Los Angeles, of course, it can be really warm, even San Diego, except like right on the coast. Um, uh, let's see. Pam, do you notice something interesting about the precipitation pattern in San Francisco? <laughs> Is anything interesting? Is that Cam? Is that Cam? Cam. Oh. Yeah. What's that? Oh, what's that? Just throughout the year, you see anything interesting compared to say here or Ottawa in terms of precip the precipitation pattern? So September. I mean, like June, July, they have some low now. Yeah, the, the ten, so let's see. So you've got, just like here, we've got about four inches of precipitation in January, February about four inches, March, uh, and then all of a sudden, boom, 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 there's nothing for months. So this is a typical dry summer pattern that we see uh, on the west coast of western region of the United States, whether it's San Francisco, uh, we have... Yeah, Sacramento, California, same thing. So that is a dead giveaway for a West Coast or Western region climate, dry summer. And that's normal. That is not a drought. A drought is when we have a below average uh, amount of precipitation received, below average. So... But for Sacramento, this is normal. You know, my first job out of, Cal out of college was in Sacramento, California. Uh, I arrived there after I graduated in May. Uh, in May uh, and it didn't rain a drop until Labor Day. I got there May 15th. It didn't rain a drop. There was no rain until Labor Day weekend. And that was normal. It, was no, it wasn't a drought. Normal. Now, if this happened here, now this would be a drought. This would be a disaster. Uh, in fact, last year was a very odd year in uh, New Orleans and Houston. New Orleans and Houston got almost no rain last summer. Very unusual. New Orleans is the second rainiest city in the United States. They got almost no rain last summer. Uh, now, that was a drought uh, when you get below average precipitation. <laughs> And a drought is a naturally occurring process. There's nothing we can do about it as human beings. If, if Mother Nature or whoever you believe in decides it's going to be dry, then that's just what it's going to be. Uh, now, there are ways that humans do impact climate. We'll talk about or weather and climate. We'll talk about those later on. Uh, so in general, uh, so there, those are the various. Uh, now, I have several other climatographs that um, you should study and um, in terms of natural hazards, of course, that region around Louisiana, Houston, Texas is that part of the country is affected mostly by hurricanes. Again, hurricanes are very large, low pressure systems and they are measured based upon wind unfortunately. Uh, and so 
I say unfortunately because Category 1 hurricane is the lowest rating hurricane. Now, below that is a tropical storm. Uh, and so a lot of times people, even in, especially in, in um, coastal regions, when they hear, oh, it's only a Category 1 hurricane or only a Category 2 hurricane, they tend not to evacuate, right? But what kills the most people in, during hurricanes is not wind, it's flooding. So if we look at, say, Hurricane Florence, 2018, uh, let me see, make some images. Uh, so here's the precipitation from Hurricane Florence. Now, Hurricane Florence was maybe a Category 1 storm, maybe weak Category 2. A lot of people did not evacuate. Oh, it's only a Category 1 or 2. Look at how much precipitation Florence dropped inland, away from the ocean, 10 inches, 15 inches, far inland. You know what happened to these people here? A lot of them ended up on the roofs of their houses getting evacuated. And they didn't leave. They thought, oh, I'm safe. Only a Category 2 storm. What's the worst that could happen? That. Uh, and so if you notice, the Saphir Simpson scale does not account for precipitation. It accounts for wind, uh, maybe in some cases storm surge. But if you're away from the coast, you're all oh, storm surge. I don't have to worry about storm surge. Uh, and a lot of people get into trouble uh, because of that. Uh, and so hurricanes tend to be a relatively regionally impact specific regions the cost of the Gulf Coast area. Um, another hazard that we might not um, associate with this part of the country is earthquakes. So notice, of course, California and Alaska and Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, is volcanic activity. Uh, the West Coast is on a fault line, a major a boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate, same thing for Alaska. So of course, we would expect to see earthquake hazards be relatively high in those parts of the country. But then we like, wait a minute, Memphis, St. Louis, it's some of the some of the um, most powerful earthquakes ever recorded in history happen right there. There's a lake in West Tennessee called Rio Foot Lake. The way that lake was formed was the Mississippi River. It was an earthquake so powerful in the early 1800s that the Mississippi River went in the opposite direction and formed Real Foot Lake, right? That's how that lake was formed. Uh, will there be another major earthquake in that region? Yes. Uh, do we know when it's going to happen? Absolutely not. Uh, and so earthquakes are impossible to predict. You know, we know when hurricanes come. We have radar, we have remote sensing, we can see it two weeks ahead of time, right? Tornadoes with radar, now we only we at least have a little bit of a warning. We know of the, the, of the uh, atmospheric conditions that will produce tornadoes. And so we can put out like tornado watches and tornado warnings but with earthquakes. Um, I was in an earthquake in San Diego um, a couple of years ago. I was in my hotel. Now, the hotel was about the size of this building, Crouch Hall. Think about this. So I'm sitting on my bed, and the whole building started to go like this. It started going through. And I, it took me a little while to realize, oh, my goodness, this is an earthquake. But where I was in San Diego, I think it might have registered about a three. The epicenter was here in the Central Valley. The epicenter of the earthquake was 250 miles away. That's like from here to Atlanta. And the earthquake is so powerful that even from 250 miles away, it made a building this size do this. And I thought, oh, what's going on? Is this, is this gonna stop? Is this gonna stop? And it finally did stop. And it's funny, like, so people who are Living in California, they're used to earthquakes, 
right? They were like, ha ha, that was nothing. Ha ha. A little uh, okay, you guys okay? Ha ha, right? The people who weren't from California were like, like me, like, oh my God, what in the world just happened? You know, a friend of mine who was from Houston, we were, that was the first day we got there. We were there for a week long meeting. He got on a plane the next morning, he was gone. He said, that's it, I've seen enough. He was out of there. These same people are scared of death of thunderstorms, right? Thunderstorm, oh my God, it's thundering lightning. What's going on? It's raining, right? Earthquake. Oh, oh, oh. So it's funny how our relative experiences uh, really influence how we feel about uh, certain phenomena. But we do have earthquakes around here. It's right today. Mini Wi-Fi camera is disrupting the video surveillance industry in the U.S. Uncover this. A question everybody's been asking today is, did you feel it? Thousands of folks are swapping stories about an early morning earthquake. The quake was centered in Illinois, but it could be felt several states away, including here in Tennessee. In fact, it was so strong, Tennessee immediately began inspecting bridges and dams. Channel Force Dennis Ferrier has the story. You may have driven right over Wayne Hunter this morning and wondered, what's he doing? In a moment, it's one of the army of PDOT inspectors okay, making sure that 437 a.m. earthquake didn't make any of our bridges unsafe. I'm looking for any indication that the bridge was shook enough to damage any of the splice plates. The earthquake was a 4.5 centered in Little New Salem, Illinois, but it had plenty of oomph. Check out what it did in Louisville. All right, we are experiencing shaking here right now in the studio. Perhaps a, a tremor of sorts. We aren't really sure. The whole studio is shaking. The quake today was right within that zone. TSU geologist Professor David Paget has studied earthquakes for a lifetime, but even he didn't put it together when it was happening. I was up doing laundry, and my whole building just shook for no several crazy. seconds. And I was standing there, and I'm thinking, is this a big truck going by? Instead, it was the New Madrid fault line that runs all along the Mississippi River, a fault line that could destroy parts of Tennessee. And the question is, how prepared are we? Where do you think people from Memphis are going to come if something happens in Memphis? You know, we might be inundated with tens of thousands of people who are, you know, evacuees from Memphis if something like that was to occur. Dennis Ferrier, Channel 4 News. Now, that was Dennis Ferrier reporting. There was some structural damage in Indiana and parts of Kentucky, but not a single report of anybody. Yeah, so, yeah, we can have, you know, you know that, that earthquake that, that, that people barely even knew happened here um, on the news, you know. If that happened in California, they wouldn't even report it. <laughs> like, how the tremor did not, you wouldn't, wouldn't even know about it. Okay, so... We are zooming into spring break. And so again, this recording is for section three. Uh, so let's make note of that. Um, okay, so for spring break, you have several assignments, but this is a good thing for you if you take advantage of it. Uh, so we had a little bit of a rocky start in the beginning of the semester. We had snow, we had some drama with financial aid, people had the class laid and come in whenever. Uh, so I'm going completely, this is not my ministry. This is not my ministry that people make up work. No, no, have no, no, I it is not my ministry. But I said, you know, there's been some things, maybe I'll make a little exception. Now, read carefully these instructions, please. Read, remember reading? Now, the way this is designed, is everyone should it should be able to get about not about at most 50 points out of these assignments but you have to read the instructions okay so here's let's see anybody in education we do have one two education this is for you only okay this is assignment this is only for those of you if you did not do Globe Assignment 1, and not a do-over, if you did Globe Assignment 1, got a low grade, that you, you, you own that. If you did not do Globe Assignment 1 at all, you got another shot at it. Like I said, this is not my ministry. I think I bumped my head. 
I don't know why I'm doing this. But yeah, we really did have a weird the snow and all that. Um, so if you're not a, an education major, that's not for you. Uh, let's see, GIS assignment three. Now remember this GIS assignment three is not for education majors. If you have not done GIS, GIS assignment three at all, you can get another shot at it. You know, again, this is not a do over, this is a do. So that would be, so whatever you qualify for, you can do. Now if you're an education major, there's no qualifiers for this other than being an edu education major. This is writing assignment two, education major. Shot. This isn't a makeup. This is a new assignment because, anyway, just give education major a chance to get caught up. Uh, let's see. Now, let me see the qualifiers for this one. Uh, if Oh, read this. If you can write a draft application to one internship listed at the link below and complete writing assignment one, only if you have not completed writing assignment one and not completed GIS assignment three. So if you have not completed writing assignment one and not completed GIS assignment three, then for this one, you can write a draft application so one of these, in, there's lots of internships in this folder. There are tons of them. Other stuff here, but there is this one. Uh, I'm gonna, I might add some more. Uh, there's like five or six listed here. Uh, you should, i.e. must, apply to at least one of those internships because uh, I know you're not gonna do it on your own because you don't believe in yourself. Uh, you, now, a draft application. Now, hopefully, we will develop that draft application into an actual application at some point so you can, uh, I can force you to do it because you don't believe in yourself. You think you're a loser. I don't think you're a loser. I think you're a winner. You have to believe that, but you don't. Um, here's another one. Again, read the instructions carefully. Uh, this is for... Now, this is not for education made. Well, let's see. This could be for anybody. See, draft application for one internship only if you have completed. So if you've done writing assignment one and GIS assignment three, then one draft, draft internship application. Here, again, please read the instructions. And last but certainly not least, Now, if you are an education major and you have completed Globe Assignment 1, then this is for you. You will, again, write a draft. So even education majors, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be funding an internship program this summer specifically for uh, education majors. I think it's going to be it's education majors who are interested in teaching science using GLOBE. I don't know what the stipend is going to be yet. I'm a generous person. You'll see. Uh, but don't think that just because you are if you are majoring in education that you have no shot at an internship. Uh, a lot of these NASA internships, um, a lot of NASA internships uh, are specifically uh, in the education majors. The main thing here is before you do any of thing, if you have any kind of question, ask me. Do not ask your classmates. Okay, ask me. Text me, Dr. Paget. I'm not sure if I qualify for assignment. What? Just, just ask me. Don't ask these people here. They, they'll lead you astray. Because what you don't want to do is do an assign, spend your time working on an assignment that you're not qualified for and you don't get any credit on oh, this. So you can get at least, I think everybody should be able to get 50 points during spring break. You're welcome. So class is dismissed, have a safe spring break. Uh, again, if you're in uh, section three, uh, again, if you have any questions, watch this recording and have a safe spring break.
and I will see you 